Right. We talk about signal manipulation. So I got some signal F of T and I'm making a new signal from it. So F of A T plus T naught. So what I say is the T naught causes a shift to the left or right. And then A causes the scaling of the T axis stuff. Okay. So if, if I say, um, just to, re to remind ourselves, if I say this, if T naught is greater than zero or less than zero, what does this do? What's my shifts here? If T naught's greater than zero or T naught's less than zero, T naught's greater than zero, which direction are we moving? To the left. And if it's, and we call this a time advance because basically features in in the original f of t happen a little bit earlier in time okay and then there's this guy which is to the right right so this would be a delay all right and then we talked about that scaling factor here we talk about a being greater than zero no sorry not zero one less than one or greater than one okay if A is less than one, what do we do with the, the signal? What's that? It, it gets wide. Yeah, we, we it expands. It gets wider. Yeah. So expands on X axis. Doesn't get any bigger vertically, right? Expands on the X axis. X axis. And if it's greater than one, it compacts. All right, now we did some examples of that, but what I really wanna to get to is, okay, what happens if I have a combination, all right? When I have a combination, there's two steps to it. First, I apply the scaling and second, I apply the shift. At the end of the day, what I ultimately end up doing is I have to basically figure out how I manipulate this guy here to be able to plug in to, to the original function, all right? So, what I do is I look at this and I say, I have F of A times T plus T naught over A. So what I really have here is a, is a scaling by A and a shifting by T naught over A. All right, I have to look at it that way. So, so I have to, and I apply the scaling first, then I apply the shifting. Okay, so let's look at an example. So I've got I've got this signal f of t, which I have shown here. Okay. And then I so it's some kind of pulse looking thing. And then I have uh, I want to compute y1 of t, which I call f of 2t plus t. And then I have example two here is I want to do f of one minus t. All right. Both of those are, are a combination of a scaling and a shifting. One of them has a negative scaling, right, which I got to be careful about. What's the negative scaling going to do? It, well, a negative scaling is, is a flip across the, the x-axis. Okay, so let's go through it step by step. All right, so y1 of t equals f of 2t plus t. So I want to compute f of 2t plus t. So I'm going to do this in two steps, right? So what did I say the first step is? Which one do I do first? The, scale, the scaling, right? So and I, the way I write this is I say f of two times t plus one. All right, so what I wanna do here is I wanna do step one is I wanna call this, I wanna compute g of t equal to f of two t, All right? So what I wanna do first is I wanna take this guy and I wanna convert him by doing the scaling first. Then I'm going to take that result and I'm going to shift it. That'll be my second step. All right. So, so what do I do? So if I have F of two T like this, what do I end up doing with that? If I say F of two T and I shouldn't call it this, I should, I should call it G of T here. G of T equals F of two T. What do I do to this function here? to get it to that. What's the first, what's that? Well, so the, the, 
Well, my 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 first step is to do the scaling, right? So I, I, I what I'm saying is I treat this like it's the argument of the whole thing, right? So so I just got to take this function f of t and I got to scale it down, right? So how do I scale this guy? If I have f, if I'm trying to figure out what does f of two t look like, forget about the two t plus two part. Just say I'm going to think about the first step. I want to compute f of two t. Well, so so you got the right idea, right? So if I have a scaling factor that's greater than one, what did we say we do? It compacts it. It compacts it, right? So if you weren't here on Friday, I, I posted that lecture. So so if I if I have a if I have a multiplier here that's greater than one, I compact it. If I have a multiplier that's less than one, I expand it. All right. So in this case, because the multiplier is greater than one, what am I going to do? I'm going to compact it. So instead of so this guy here, all right, basically I'm going to just go left to right here. So I see this guy drops down at negative two, right? If I look at f of t, it drops down at negative two, hits negative one, and then goes up. So where is he going to start to drop? Where where should I start to drop at negative two or what? Negative one. All right, <clears throat> and he's going to drop down and then come back up. Now, at what point is it going to equal to one? So I'm compacting it. Basically, I'm just shifting everything in. It should still hit one at t equal to zero, right? So he's going to equal one right here. So he's going to come down to one at what point? Where does he reach negative one? negative so this would be at negative one half right and then boom and then he's going to go like this and a t equal to one is the point at which he's going to drop over like that okay now if you're not sure the thing you can always do is you can say okay um i can plug in t equal to a certain set of values so i can say t equal to like negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, et cetera. And I can say, all right, what is G of T and what is F of T at those points, right? And I just keep plugging in. Well, at negative two, F of T is equal to zero. G of T would be F of two T. So this would be F of negative four, right? So I keep, basically I can, it should be the case that the values are the same. So at t equal to zero, g of zero and f of zero are the same, right? So I, I can just plug in I plug in the points into each function and see if they match up, okay? That's one way, probably the easiest way to do it, right? Is to just, if you're not sure, just plug in the values and see how they match up, all right? So I did a compaction of the signal, all right? So now what's the next step? shift and if i have if i have a, a plus one here which way am i going to shift that guy to the left by one right so this guy is going to end up and i got to be careful what i got to shift on step two is i took this guy to g of t he um, looks like this this was my g of t where this was negative one this was one like that this is g of t. Step two is to compute y1 of t equal to g of t plus one. So I take g of t and I shift it left by one. Okay. So that gives me, if I take g of t here, if I take this guy and I shift it left by one, what's it look like? Where is he going to start? Yeah, he's going to start at negative two. He's going to come down and basically hit negative one at, at minus three halves. Then he's going to come up to one like that. Then he's going to stay there and come down at zero. Like that. 
All right. So I so so the way I think of it is I can I make this intermediate conversion, right? Where I do the scaling first, and then I take that thing that I that I got through the scaling and I shift it. Okay. That's how I get a compound result. Okay. So there's there's our final result right there, right? When I look at that, those two steps. All right, let's do another example. Okay. I have f of one minus t. All right. First thing I got to do is factor this thing around here, right? So that's the same as what? What's my scaling factor here? Negative one. So I factor a negative one out of the argument. So it becomes t minus one like that. All right. So step one is to apply the scaling. Step one, apply scaling. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute G of T equal to what? F of, what am I going to do to F to get this intermediate function? Negative T. All right. So how do I get, how do I factor that guy over? What would I, what's, what happens when I have a negative sign in front of the time argument? It mirrors it, right? And again, I could plug in values of T to do that, right? And I could always, I could always say, for every value of t, I could try out for every value of t, I could write out f of t and g of t equal to f of negative t. And I could easily map this out for myself. I could say, well, at t equal to negative 2, f of t is equal to 0. And then g of negative 2 would be equal to f of 2, right? Basically, what you're saying is, is, I, is how do I map it over? So the mapping is pretty simple in this case. If I flip this over, this guy is going to do this. What did it do? There we go. All right. So at negative two, this guy's going to go flat. And then what's going to happen at negative two if I've mirrored it? It's going to rise up to one going to stay there until t equal to zero, then what happens? Yep, slopes down to negative one and then rises back up. Oops, slope down too much. Like that. Okay, so this guy here is what I call g of t, which is f of negative t. All right. Stuff's not hard, it's just methodical, right? Just gotta go go slow. It's like algebra. We're saying algebra, it's methodical, just go slow. Right. All right. This guy is my so then I do my final one, right? Y two of t. All right. So we already did minus one times t minus one. Okay. So we we created our g of t, which was the mirror image. So it goes up, levels off, down, up, like that. I'm trying to keep them aligned. Like that. How do I compute here in step two? What is step two? Now I compute y2 of t is equal to g, the intermediate function, shifted by one. So which way do I shift it if it's a minus one shift? To the right. So now instead of rising up at negative two, where's this guy gonna rise up? Negative one, he's gonna rise up, stay there. Then he's gonna come down and he's gonna come up and it's that, all right? Just two steps to it, all right? And there's our final picture. So it's it's fairly straightforward. You've got some stuff in the homework that is like this, all right, for sure. Um, the other thing you have in the homework is something we talked about Friday, which was basically what happens if I have a signal like this one, which is a pulse, which is some kind of combination of other signals, right? So what we said is this particular signal rises up to one at t equal to zero, stays there until I get to t equal to three and then comes down. 
what we said is that guy is like the summation of u of t, right? So a unit step plus a negative unit step at, that begins at t equal to three. If I add these two things together at every point in time, so in other words, at every point in time, meaning at t equal to zero, at t equal to one, at t equal to two, or t equal to three, what I get when I sum those is that. All right, so you've got some stuff like that in the in the homework that you you deal with. Okay. All right. Not the most exciting thing uh, in the world, like I said, but it's it's an important concept to to be able to build that stuff out. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. All right. That's all I have to say about that. Let's go to the other thing that I want to start talking about, which is our next major topic, which is Fourier series. All right. So what is a Fourier series? Who knows? Anybody know? All right. Yeah, basically, okay, the fact that you, the fact that you don't know is a good thing. It means we're not doing something redundant. Um Fourier series, basically, if I have a periodic function, any periodic function in the world can be thought of as the sum of sine waves. And those sine waves are what we call harmonically related. Anybody know what it means to be harmonically related? Yeah, their frequencies are integer multiples of each other. All right. So um, now the book has, there's two sections. There's a whole chapter, chapter nine on Fourier series. We're only going to cover 9.1 and 9.2, um, which is really kind of sort of the typical thing. So what are some common signals, like Fourier representation of common signals? Like what's a common periodic signal that you come across? Well, the most common one is the sine wave, right? We dealt with that. What's another common one? Well, what about a, what about a square wave, right? That, comes, that, that happens all the time, right? If I have a square wave, that's a common periodic signal. This guy can be thought of as the sum. Here's, where, here's how we're going to write this. C sub n cosine n omega naught t plus phi sub n. Now we're going to have multiple ways of writing that, which we'll figure out. But basically what this is saying is it's a sum of a bunch of, of waveforms. There's a whole, there's a boatload of formulas there in section 9.1. All right, I simplify them down here into just a, a handful of formulas, but there's there's many, many, basically because there's three ways of writing a Fourier series. All right. <clears throat> and we're gonna we're gonna primarily deal with one of those. Okay. But to to get into that, we got to do some some stuff today to kind of remember the different ways we can kind of capture those things. All right. So we say we're all about dynamic systems, like an RC circuit. Okay. There's going to be a differential equation for this guy. We could write that out if we wanted to, to say, here's my voltage source V in, and then I get a voltage across that capacitor V out. Okay. There's a transient response and a steady state response. Okay. What's the steady state response going to be for this circuit? What's the steady state response going to be? If this is my input, this is V in here. So V in of T is a cosine. Tell me in general, what is V out going to look like? If V in of T is a pure cosine, this guy is V cosine omega T plus, let's, let's just say it's V cosine omega T. That guy's just a pure cosine. It's going to be almost the same, right? It's going to be still a cosine. Does the frequency change? No. We'll call this guy, we'll say he's got a magnitude V out, omega T plus what do we what do we know about the the angle of that voltage, the phase of that voltage? What's that? Well, is it gonna be the exact same? So this guy, first of all, what angle did what phase does this guy? Cosine omega T. What's the phase angle of that? Zero. Well, this one is phi. It's, I, it's probably not going to be the same. But what it's saying is in steady state, if I put V cosine omega T in, I get a cosine out at the same frequency. He might be scaled vertically, right? Scaled 
I'll say scaled vertically. In other words, he might be bigger or smaller than the input, and he might be shifted left or right. In steady state, that's the case. Now I can add to that the transient response. What's true about the transient response? Well, it goes away pretty quickly. And most of the time people use things like simulations and things like that to deal with the transient response because if this thing was a circuit doing audio stuff, audio processing or something like that, most of the time it's in steady state. All right. So, so I don't have too much to worry about. Usually I don't think about that. Now, basically the right way to solve for V out is a differential equation, right? That's always going to give me the right answer. But if I only cared about the steady state, do I have to do a differential equation? What have you learned with Yahoo? What do you do with Yahoo if he asks you for the steady state voltage? You don't do a differential equation at this point. You do it, you, you have a phasor domain, which means you do it with, with what? Impedances, right? The fact that, so the fact that cosines, if I have a cosine as my input, it's always going to give me an output that is just scaled and shifted means that I'm able to use impedance analysis, which is nice, right? So it, in, in other words, it's nice in the sense of, I guarantee you prefer that over right now differential equations every time, right? So what happens if I have this, right? If I have a square wave going into this thing, what do I have to do then? Can I use impedance analysis with this? What's impedance analysis assume? What's the basic inherent assumption with impedance analysis? And that's, well, not quite. The basic, what, what allowed me to use impedance analysis? What has to be true about my input? Not just AC, but it has to be specifically what? It has to be a sine wave, right? So, or a cosine, it has to be a sine wave. That's not a sine wave. So I cannot use impedance analysis. I have to do a differential equation, right? If you thought about what's going on here, basically this, this output would rise up, level off. It would do this sort of thing, right? It'd be a bunch of transient responses. That's what it sort of looked like. I have to use differential equations to solve this. I can't use impedance analysis unless I make use of the idea of Fourier, which is to say, anytime I have a periodic voltage, I can end up representing this guy as a bunch of sine waves added up. Well, it turns out it's not as bad as it looks. It's actually it's a lot better than doing the differential equation, right? And differential equation would certainly suck. This guy would this guy would be well, but so if I if I have a bunch of sources in series, right? Then I can do superposition and I can basically think of each one individually and add them up, right? So this guy would basically be whatever. We'll we'll deal with this idea a little bit more. Basically, I have I have what I call a fundamental term, and then I have all of these what I call harmonic terms, which are which are related to it. And so I could analyze at each individual frequency. And it turns out if I'm able to analyze at one, I could just generalize it to all the other ones, right? So it's, it's nowhere near as nasty as it, as it might look. And it's a heck of a lot easier than, than trying to do the differential equations, okay? Now, where this is, comes up a lot, right? So this is an example I always use. This is, this is like one that you'll see probably on the second project. Yeah. So, so what am I doing here? This... The microwave. Um, so this, what this guy is, this, so this is a, this is a, so I got a PV panel on one side. All right. And I have an inverter. So any of you know anything about a solar panel? What kind of, what kind of voltage do I get out of a solar panel? I get, I, well, so it's DC, it's DC. And if, if we want to get serious about it, it's about 30 volts. All right. So if I have a real solar panel, what? How much power do I get out of a single solar panel? Did you say? Uh it's good. Yeah. Well, so you get about you about three hundred and nowadays I don't know they're probably pushing three hundred and twenty watts, right? Something like that. Um, so about about thirty volts is the peak value. 
if I'm talking about V, if I talk about a residential grid over here, this would be 240 volts AC. If I say volts AC, what does that mean about the voltage? I forget, I always talked about that. Well, but if I specifically, when you say volts AC, that has a specific meaning in terms of the RMS value of the voltage. See how we talked about that? All right. All right. Let me say 200 volt, 240 volts RMS is what's there. Now that grid voltage looks like this. All right. What I do, this V sub I, which what comes out of this inverter here, this circuit goes from DC to AC. V sub I looks like this. And V sub grid looks like that. All right. So somehow I got to design this filter here so that it goes from V sub I to V sub G. So I can, so there is somewhere inside of V sub I something that looks like a sine wave because this is a period, V sub I is a periodic waveform. So I need some way of analyzing that thing to be able to, to think about all of the individual sine waves that are contained inside of it. Okay. Um, another common example of where to think about this, this is the voltage in EPIC. Right. When I say the voltage, I mean I basically we hooked up a we hooked up a meter, put it on an oscilloscope to see what the voltage looked like at the wall outlet. Now what is what is what's the voltage of the wall outlet supposed to be? 120 times square root of two, and, and this is scaled down to make it safer, right? That's why the don't worry about the peak value. The peak value should be 120 times the square root of two. We scaled it down again to, because just to protect the oscilloscope. But does that What's it's supposed to be 120 times square root of two with its peak value, but it's also supposed to be what kind of waveform? Sine wave. Is that a sine wave? No, it is 60 hertz like it should be, but it's not a sine wave. We say it has a fundamental frequency of 60 hertz, and we're going to define that on Wednesday, what that means. But inside of that waveform, if I look at it carefully, it turns out it's got a bunch of what we call harmonics. So it has a 60 hertz, it has a 120 hertz, so two times that frequency. It has a 180 hertz, three times that frequency. Four would be 240. Five would be 300. And as it turns out, he, does, he doesn't have too much 120 or 240. He has a heck of a lot of 180, he has a heck of a lot of 300. All right, now why that is is because of the physics of the, of the grid. All right, but it's, he's ugly looking. And and so oftentimes, you know, we need to do things like where we measure how much of each component do we have? How much do I have at the third harmonic, the fifth harmonic, all that kind of stuff. So we're gonna talk about that. I just wanna introduce the idea of, we, we need to be able to analyze waveforms like this. And I showed you guys before, right? Where I did the audio thing with my voice on the phone and you saw the different signals at the different frequencies. We're going we're gonna to get into that concept now a little bit more, but we got to understand the basic ideas first. All right, so before I can really get into Fourier series, one thing I want to make sure of is that we, we kind of remember all the different ways of treating a sinusoid. We basically have learned kind of four different ways. That, so, so the most common way we think of uh, just a general sine wave, and again, I said, the reason we talk about sine waves all the time, it gets boring, gets old, but basically everything you deal with, every real world signal that you deal with is at some level a cosine, right? So if I'm thinking about communications, cell phones, right? The radio waves that are transmitted, those are gonna be sinusoids, right? Um, power signals, audio signals, all of those are sine waves. So they're really common signal for us to deal with. In general, I say I have something that looks like this right? C cosine omega T plus phi N. Somehow it's shifted and scaled from a regular cosine. And I can represent that same cosine at one given frequency as a sum of a single cosine and sine, where notice that these have no shift, right? Right. So my, I'm not saying cosine omega T plus phi, I'm saying cosine omega T and sine omega T. Or I can say that this guy is somehow using Euler's identity that. All right, we're gonna look at this in a minute, but what the heck is that? In words, what does that mean? If you had to say in words, what does that statement mean that I underline? 
That means I can think of this cosine function as what? Two rotating vectors in the complex plane. Okay. Two rotating vectors in the complex plane. Or I can say it's the real part of this whole thing, where really what you use in circuits two is just this. All right. You just use the phaser of that whole thing. Now, these things, we got to keep the time domain piece of it here, in this case, to be able to do the Fourier series analysis part. But I want to make sure that we understand and remember how those all relate to each other. Okay, so if I have this thing here, C cosine omega T plus phi, for the picture that I've drawn right here, what is, how do I represent on this graph? Here's my time axis. Here's my X of T axis. How do I... Um, Where's, where, where do I see the C here? Where is that for this, supposedly? What's that? Where? Yeah, it's the amplitude, right? So there's C. What's the phi in this particular case? Zero, right? This guy is just pure cosine. What's that? Okay. Um, <laughs> What if for what I've drawn right here, so four cosine omega T minus 90 degrees. All right, so phi is clearly equal to minus 90. All right, so <clears throat> what's my amplitude here? My amplitude's four, right? And I've got uh, omega T minus 90. How can I express this as a sine? Well, four times sine of what? Well, so I drew four cosine omega t minus 90. That's what I've drawn there. What is that clearly equal to based on that picture? Yeah, just omega t, right? So if I if I shift like that, I, I get that representation. All right, now you guys understand how to deal with the cosine omega t plus phi. But this second approach, you can think of any cosine with a shift as basically the summation of a cosine without a shift and a sign without a shift. Now, the reason I'm doing this now is because when I start getting into Fourier series, we're gonna look at all the different forms of the series. I can think of a single cos of a, of a, I can think of a periodic waveform as the sum of a bunch of cosines with this form, as the sum of a bunch of sines and cosines of this form, or the, sign, the, the sum of a bunch of complex exponentials in this form. So we're going to we're going to deal with all that stuff as we go. For for now, all I just want you to understand is if I on the homework, if I give you something that is, you know, 2 times cosine 2 pi 1000t plus 45 degrees, you can convert it between all of these different forms. Okay? All right. So <clears throat> one we we didn't spend too much time talking about before, but this guy right here, right? How do I that a and b those are those are values that I can figure out in terms of the amplitude and the phase angle. In other words, A and B here are a function of C and phi. So how can I figure those out? <clears throat> well, there's a, there's a trig identity. Cosine alpha plus beta. Anybody remember what that is? Probably not. Cosine times cosine, cosine alpha, cosine beta. <laughs> yeah, and it, it becomes minus sine of alpha. Close enough, that was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, all right. <clears throat> yeah, so it's so it's that. Now, if I, if I look at that, um, I can basically use that same thing here, right, on this. So this guy here could be alpha, and this guy here could be beta. And if that's the case, this guy becomes C times cosine of, let's just do it this way, C cosine of alpha, cosine of beta. So that becomes cosine of phi, cosine of omega t, minus C times sine of phi, sine of omega t. Now, if I try to match that to this form right here, what do I see is true about A and B? 
What's let's do A. A is the easy one. C cosine phi. All right. What about B? Negative C sine of phi. All right. Basically, it's saying if I know the shift and the amplitude of this thing, I can figure out how to represent this cosine as sort of a as of a sum of a cosine and the sum of a sine. All right. So let's say we got this example here. X of t is two cosine two pi one thousand t plus forty five degrees, and I want to represent that as a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. Now I'm going to figure out what, uh, so first of all, what's omega? That you should know. 2 pi 1,000, right? 2 pi 1,000. All right. Looking at my picture there, which one is, I've got all three of these graphed, right? I graphed A cosine omega t, B sine omega t, and 2 cosine 2 pi 1,000 t plus 45 degrees. All right. Let's look at this individually. So t equals zero is here. Okay. Which one of these is A cosine omega t? The red one. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're light there. Yeah. The, the the yellow one is light. So this is this is the A cosine omega t. Where's the B sine omega t? That's the yellow one. Yeah, the yellow doesn't come in very strong, does it? Right. And then, well, that leaves the blue one has to be the other one. Right. But how can I how can I see that that's got to be the case? I can look at the amplitude. Right. This is a two right here. Right. This guy here is X of T. Now, I see that the amplitudes of the cosine and the sine are both smaller. They should be right because they're somehow adding up to something bigger. Right. And what would the values be? Well, I can just go back to my previous slide here with the formulas, right? A equals C cosine phi, B equals negative C sine phi, right? So if I look at this, A equals two times what? Cosine of 45. All right, cosine of 45 is um, one over the square root of two. Right. So I work that becomes two over the square root of two. So that should become about 1.4 or something like that. And that looks like it's about where it's maxing off. Okay. And then the other one is negative two sine of 45 degrees. What's true about the sine and the cosine of 45? They're the same. Right. So this guy becomes negative two over square root of two, or about negative 1.4. And it looks like that's the case, right? Because I can see he maxes out down here at about negative, at about 1.4. And he's, how do I, how can I see the negative? The fact that this guy is inverted, the fact that I see sine going down first and then coming back up. All right. So the kind of stuff I'll give you in the homework there. And you have, you have, I think the last two problems that deal with this. I give you something like two cosine two pi one thousand t plus forty five, and you got to figure out okay, what are the a and the b values? Okay. Now, the other thing is I may want to be able to represent this guy, and this this is the one that we use the most when we do our calculus. We're going to figure out how to. So the, the kind of problems you're going to get eventually is I'm going to give you something like that square wave, and you have to figure out okay, what are the amplitudes of all of these waves that go into it. All right, there's specific values of those and that takes calculus to do. The calculus sucks when you do it on trig because trig functions and calculus is nasty in general. And just the steps are nastier. The, it becomes much easier when we convert those trig functions over into what? Complex exponentials. So, so it's important for us to remember that relationship between the complex exponential and the cosine because it clears up a lot of the calculus, okay? All right, so our third approach is to look at this guy like this, right? How did I, how did I get this relationship? We did that for exam one. We've done it a lot since. 
Yeah, this is all Oilers identity, right? Oilers identity. Okay. Now what I've shown here is <clears throat> if I if I plugged this in here as theta into Euler's identity, I get this whole thing. All right. And C E to the J phi N over two and C E to the negative J phi N over two. What I've done is I've written this as two vectors in the complex plane, right? The length of each one is C over two. The angle of the, of the top one is phi N. The angle of the bottom one is negative phi N, right? So looking at those two, what do we say that they are? C over two, I, so, so first of all, I call this guy with respect to this, I call this my alpha one. Right, so we're gonna have a reason why we use that variable. Alpha one is C over two with an angle of phi n. And this guy is C over two, I call it alpha minus one. C over two e to the negative j phi n. What do I see about those two vectors? How do they relate to each other? Alpha one and alpha minus one. How do those two relate to each other? They're complex conjugates, right? Meaning that they have the same magnitude and their angles are opposite of each other, okay? So which one of these is, so we say that these two both rotate, right? This one rotates in the positive direction, meaning as time advances, he moves that way. And as time advances, this guy moves this way, okay? All right, so let's take a look at that then. So let's say I have this guy, 2 cosine 2 pi 1,000 t plus 45 degrees. And I want to express that in that form. So I'm going to say this guy becomes alpha 1 e to the j 2 pi 1,000 t plus alpha minus 1 e to the negative j 2 pi 1,000 t. Okay. What would be my alpha 1 here? What would be my alpha one? Yeah, two over two. Yeah, so one. E to the what angle? E, yeah, 45. All right, if I were to sketch that, where would that be? So, yeah. So I, I drew my, my unit circle and then I drew this guy to here. So that would be in the first quadrant. And I'd have this. This guy would be my alpha one. Without doing any work, where's alpha minus one? Opposite, meaning he's in the fourth quadrant going this way. This would be my alpha minus one. Right? So the way I look at this is I say alpha one and alpha minus one are conjugates of each other. And the magnitude of alpha one is one. The angle of alpha one is 45 degrees. Okay, it's very straightforward to really do this. The third way we have of writing this is we say, okay, well, what happens if I just represent it in terms of what I called this dynamic phasor idea, right? So we said, if I had as my example, X of T equals two cosine two pi 1000 T plus 45 degrees, right? What I say with this is I have a vector that starts out here that has a length of two, right? This guy here would be two e to the j, 45 degrees like that, okay? And which direction would this guy move over time? This is one, this is two. Which direction would this vector move over time? Counterclockwise, right? So I can represent it as one vector, which has the full length, two vectors that have half the length moving in opposite directions. All right, not that particularly exciting, but we, we can relate all those angles to each other. All right, and that becomes useful once we really get into the Fourier series of, and, and looking at all the different forms of the series, which we're gonna start doing on Wednesday. <laughs> The, the my yeah my wait I think I drew my vectors there going to yeah my vector should be half the list the, the distance there this guy should go to here 
and this guy should go to here like that yeah that's what that's what you're getting at yeah okay